My dear friends, a couple of days ago, my friend of mine asked me to speak about uh, grace. Mm, I thought about that and then thinking about that and I meditated on that subject. You know, the grace is like an ocean. There's uh, how to explore an ocean. Mm? It's too deep, too vast, too broad. Uh, the depth and dimension of this uh, virtue called grace or the value, Christian value called grace is immense, immense. Uh, it has no limit. We'll see. So these are my few thoughts born out of my own meditation on this uh, great uh, value, Christian value or virtue of, of grace. You know, in our ordinary conversations, in our discussions, we have a usual ordinary expressions. You are gracious. I am grateful. You express gratitude for the favors or the good things you have done. Look at the terminologies. These are all very beautiful. And when, when, when we look at somebody well-presented person, we say, you look graceful. Rarely we use it, we may say beautiful, but we say, you look graceful. It's really a wonderful, wonderful term. The roots of it all in the virtue or the value of grace. You know, just uh, uh, a few weeks ago, to two female students were attending university at Ottawa, Univers Ottawa University. One of them asked me, you know, Father, if uh, some of the seniors want some groceries or some help, you know, I'm, you contact me, I'm great, uh, I'm really happy to help those individuals who need help. It was really beautiful. You know, it's gracious on their part, on that one female individual person to ask, me and and say i was i was deeply felt that there are some graceful gracious people are there to help each other even though that person would not know but two days later the university closed and she had to leave for home but i thought about those these are the persons who are helping us and doing these things graciously something beautiful about our Christian kind of Christian life. We say grace builds on nature. Grace is not out in the vacuum. Grace is on this nature. That nature is ours. So, God built us, our nature, and then grace builds on this nature. The favor, the goodness, gracious things that God is trying to do. It is bodily, physical nature, and this grace builds on that nature. Why? Because God is good. God is graceful. God is gracious. God himself is grace. Simply grace goes without saying. No emphasis. Simply put, God himself is grace. And so he is gracious enough to grant this grace to build on the nature. It is God's gift. Grace is God's favor. It's a gratuitous gift for us to participate in his gracious life. That grace we receive really is in and through the sacraments. That's, we'll touch upon that later in the, what the church is teaching about this grace. And so, this grace is meant for our sanctification. 
this sanctification, the sanctifying grace, enables us to partake in the life of God, who is graceful and gracious, and grace itself. God's grace gives us an opportunity to be able to be in communion with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we also speak about the Holy Spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit who infuses the grace to transform our inner life, inner being, our soul, because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit within us in and through the baptism. In the whole process, we become children of God because after all, we are God's images and living icons. The very nature of gr grace is to sanctify us. So we, the baptized Catholic Christians, are part of that grace, becoming children of God. So mind you, it is the gratuitous gift that God gives us. If we are not baptized, how can we receive grace of God? How can we become the children of God? Or how can we become new creation of God? God is so gracious and generous. God gives us, the baptized Catholic Christians, the unconditional and gratuitous grace so that God enters into personal communion with us because he loved us so very much, he wants to dwell within us and among us. Now let's see some of the biblical references, meanings of grace. After all, we always bring in not only sacred scripture, but also living tradition and teaching of the church all together. Just like we, every time we speak about the sacraments of God, we are, we are implying Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The grace is there, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But each individual, this when we separate, each individual personality is three persons, but one God has immense uh, activity within us. God created the world, he sent his only son, he emptied himself for us, and the Holy Spirit now, now carrying our church, inspiring us, protecting us, bringing us together for the worship of God in the churches. So in that sense, in the Bible as we know, we have two testaments. One is Old Testament, the other one is New Testament. Let's first go to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there is no one point blank term to describe, to say about this grace. In fact, there are many notions, many expressions in the Old Testament. For example, the personal favor of God. We do not know why God favored Israel, Hebrew people. There were many other people, Hittites, uh, Jezebites, uh, Moabites, uh, Palestinians, and many of the people were living, Babylonians, Assyrians, many people, but he chose and finally brought these Hebrew people through Abraham, father of faith. So God, in that sense, brings in a personal favor, and that meant to be gracious, that we see in the book of Genesis in particular, and also Exodus, lots of favors that God has given, not only selecting, choosing Hebrew people, but giving them favors every day, every time, until they reach the promised land. So, it is also that grace can also mean loving devotion of God to humans because God loved us. God loved Israel so very much. So being a loving devotion of God to the humans. So this is really concretized 
concretely speaking, concretize in their gift of salvation. Now, they thought about the salvation in the sense of entering into the promised land. They were under Pharaoh in Egypt, under the clutches of Pharaoh, having no freedom, having no liberation, nothing. Finally, they were set free and they were going to the promised land. That's immediate salvation for them. They did not have a great concept of heaven reaching someday to heaven. That wasn't there. That was their thinking, gift of salvation. It is in this context, I want you to remember the very powerful Hebrew word called hesed. Hebrew word, hesed, which has several meanings. And they used it profusely, several meanings. For example, love, goodness, kindness, charity, mercy, grace itself. These we find in the history of the Hebrew people and, of course, God in the covenantal relationship and God's fidelity to, with these Hebrew people in the Old Testament. See, God constantly made covenant and remained faithful. So it's God's fidelity as well as the covenantal relationship. I am your God, you are my people. You have to obey. I will give you favors, you see. This kind of you know, covenantal relation, an agreement between the two people, two parties. So in that sense, hesed became a powerful word, Hebrew word, for the people of Israel or Hebrew people. Now we enter into New Testament. Grace is immensely used by St. Paul in his letters. St. Paul wrote 13 letters. Could be more, but we don't have, but 13 letters he wrote. And so they are wonderful in the terminology. And the term he used was charis. That is Greek term. Greek was the lingua franca at that time. Greek was very much a spoken language. It's a Greek word. Here, St. Paul understands grace, or charis, as the very essence of God's salvific action in Christ Jesus. Much of this explanation, the terminology charis, is in the letter to the Romans. That doesn't mean in other letters, but more so in the letter to the Romans. If we carefully read, we find this very essence of God's salvific action in Christ Jesus. Who he is? Christ Jesus is the cause of our redemption because he is the redeemer, he is also our savior. He saved us, he came down to save us. So many expressions are also used by St. Paul's letters to the Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians. Let me quote a few of these. Grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, Grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's gracious work of salvation is the gift of justification of sinners. St. Paul brings about goods of salvation, meaning we are becoming children of God in these goods, God's glory, eternal life. They're all salvific meaning these glory of God, eternal life, life eternal, all this means are goods of salvation. This also involves the body of Christ. Now, body of Christ has many meanings, but here I restrict it to church, the body of Christ. We are all temples of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ, and we are the church. Not the building. Building is empty unless we come together and, and worship God and celebrate our liturgies, our paraliturgies, our sacraments, and many other spiritual duties we do. We are the ones coming. We are the church. And so, body of Christ, baptized children of body of Christ, becoming the church itself. And so, the grace of God gives us various gifts 
And that is what St. Paul called charisma. For our salvation, you remember St. Paul's letter to Corinthians, where he speaks about charisms. Again, there are Greek words, charisms, which means gifts of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul went there, and the Corinthians were a very peculiar kind of people. But he saw some of the spiritual gifts in that place, in that little group, in that little church, Corinthians. And so he called charisms, gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom and understanding, counsel, sound judgment, and so on. Those are all part of the Holy Spirit. And so all to state that grace, the grace of the love of God for us. Every time St. Paul visited these churches, be it Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, and um, Romans, Thessalonica, these are all little, little churches, mission churches he established to whom he wrote, but he also used the greetings. He did not say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. He said, the grace of God and the love of Christ. Peace of God, grace of God be with you always. That's what we say every Mass at the very beginning after the sign of the cross. We say that, grace of God. So that was very important for St. Paul. So as we can see and find so many meanings of grace in the sacred scripture. So in the Old Testament, Hebrew word was has said in the New Testament, the Greek word for grace is charis. Simply put, altogether simply put, God loves us so much by his own initiative and in freedom, God poured or pours grace after grace after grace into our hearts to form and to establish personal communion of life and love with us. All this is God's, God's initiative. As I said before, it's a free gift. Grace is a free gift. It's a gratuitous gift to have a communion of life and love with us humans. So God's word is full of grace. We see that in St. John's Gospel, very first chapter, the God's word is full of grace. You know, when Gabriel, the archangel, came to greet Blessed Virgin Mary, 13, 14 years old in Nazareth. It's a beautiful place there, Nazareth. He came, Hail Mary, full of grace. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean grace as a holy sanctification, what he saw, but can also mean, but there's a greeting, beautiful, graceful. You are gracious, you're graceful, full of grace. That's what we call Mary in, in our rosary, we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. And so St. Paul's greetings also same to all the churches, grace and peace. Grace is really the principle of Christian life, Christian action, and Christian mission. Grace is a supernatural gift meant for our sanctification to obtain or to achieve salvation. So this rich term grace must be weaved into theological clothing, so to speak, for a better understanding. Theology is part of also Second Vatican Council and all of our council teachings also theology. For the Greek fathers, the grace of God causes human beings to be divinized. That's how the Greek fathers, early fathers of the church thought and, and discussed on this matter. The grace of God causes human beings to be divinized. Human divinized, to be making divine. In other words, God became human being so that human beings can become God. Can they really? Only with grace they can because they would be encountering 
God in his presence someday because of the grace that he has given us. So here I have to bring in my good old friend, St. Augustine. Why I say good old friend? Because I read his confession and a few other books, a few other articles. I was fascinated by his thought in the fourth century. Immensely gifted man. Why here St. Augustine, my friend, the doctor of the, he was called doctor of grace. Because he taught the church about grace. Now, he speaks about his grace in his book Confessions in which he confesses the great things that God did in his life. You know, he was a debaucherous man. He, from North Africa, he, Algiers, place called Algiers, Tagaste, there he became bishop there. He came to Rome and it is in Rome he became leading a debaucher. He was like a prodigal son. In the gospel that we see, prod graceless man. His mother Monica constantly prayed for his conversion. And it is during that conversion process he realized and understood, grasped, tasted this grace. And that's why he is doctor of grace. So St. Augustine sees grace as a help that was given to him. Help in the human soul, in his own soul, to be effective for his and our salvation. It is by the grace of God, both St. Paul and St. Augustine were converted. St. Paul was Pharisee, brilliant man, Roman citizen. He, is a, he was a tent maker, you know. He did his job, but yet he was consumed with anger of new things happening after Jesus Christ's resurrection. So he was mad and angry. He went house after house killing people. St. Augustine, even though his mother was very devout Catholic, and he did, he was like a prodigal son. What more can I say? But both St. Paul became apostle after conversion because he witnessed Jesus Christ. And St. Augustine, doctor of the grace and doctor of the church, became even a bishop. All because of God's initiative, pouring in their heart, the grace after grace after grace. Now, there are many subdivisions in this great ocean called grace. And therefore, the theological students really, because so many explanations, means really means nothing very much for us simple minded people. But the grace, what we are talking about, is simple and beautiful. Few explanations for sanctification, for our salvation. That is a fundamental thing. All other, some of the saints, some of the theologians speaking, so many subdivisions that are not necessary for us to know. So then, what does the church say? We began with ordinary example, a kind of, I call it an anthropological approach to this grace. You are gracious, graceful, gratitude, and all that I spoke about. And then Old Testament, New Testament, then theology. Now we are talking about the church is talking about? What does church say? Mm -hmm. That we find in the catechism of the Catholic Church. It says kinds of grace, it's a particularly two definitions or descriptions catechism gives about grace. Habitual grace, one. Habitual grace is sanctifying grace which is the permanent and supernatural disposition that perfects our soul to enable to live with God and act by God's love. Unless we have this grace, habitual grace, our soul will not be sanctified and we will not be acting out of love of God. 
Therefore, this grace perfects our soul as God created us in his own image and likeness. Second one is actual grace. This is God's intervention at the beginning of conversion and in the work of sanctification. Always these are the terms go with that grace, sanctification, salvation, love of God, favor of God, doing good things, doing Christian way of doing things. These are the main kind of you know, things for us to know. Now further to bring, as we know, church is the custodian of the sacraments. We Catholics have and believe in seven sacraments, baptism being the first one. Every sacrament is related to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one way or the other. Even their function and operation slightly different. Baptism making a children of God, already infusing that grace, Holy Spirit infusing grace within us. Then confirmation, sealing those sacramental gifts that we received. Then confession or reconciliation. We are reconciling with ourselves, with God, and with our neighbors because we are belonging to the church. Forgiven, clean slate, as they say. Then Holy Communion, what we eat, we become what we become, what we eat, the body of Christ. That's the grace, strength, more powerful. It is that grace leading us to the kingdom of heaven. Then we have marriage, sacrament of marriage. That's between the spouses to help each other. That grace, particularly that grace, giving them strength, support, grace to help each other, to grow with each other, complement each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful grace that, because that's why marriage is good. Then we have ordination to the priesthood. That grace to sanctify the people of God in prayer, in distribution of the Holy Eucharist, in baptizing children, in, in, in various ways, in sanctifying through the sacrament of reconciliation. Then we have anointing of the sick. That's also part of our ordination. Anointing of the sick. That's also Holy Spirit giving these individuals grace and strength and on their way towards the kingdom of heaven. So all the seven sacraments are looked after by the church. So the church is the greatest sacrament in a way, is a custodian looking after those beautiful, holy, sacred graces. So these church is custodian therefore, they are sanctifying grace, sacred grace, holy grace that require faith on our part to have its effect for our sanctification, to achieve salvation one day, to see face to face God our Father. It is this grace gives us this grace. And so, may the peace and grace of God be with you always. And let us be united in prayer. Prayer is also simplified grace, that we, we find presence of God in our life. So this grace be a great gift from God to us and in these days we ask God to give us grace to our children, to teenagers, students, adults, spouses, parents, grandparents, everyone, so that we may be always, we may always walk in the right path and towards the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Grace be with you.